What's up, Life Church 360? My name is David Seta. I get to be the youth pastor here. This is my wife, Kaylana Seta. She is a middle school youth director. Mm -hmm. And Life Church 360 exists to help you build a life giving relationship with Jesus. And that's done by four main principles. It's literally the heartbeat of our church mm -hmm. to love God, invest in others faithfully serve, and encourage the world. So today I believe that this message is going to touch each and every person that hears it. So what I want you to do is go ahead, like, comment down below. Mm -hmm. Let us know who you're watching with, where you're watching from. We also have a podcast now. So thank you for listening and tuning in. Yes, and as well on our group page, we've added a marriage group. And if you're like us, and not only being newly married, but also just bringing home stress from work or being stuck inside the same same house together. Yes. This is an awesome group to join, <laughs> to go ahead and work along with people that are just gonna give you tools to help build your marriage in a really, really healthy way. So we, we are excited. We need that, we need that group. We're excited to join the group. Yeah, we need that. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'd like to add that our Go Kids 360 Facebook page has interactional videos for you and your kids during this time of all age groups the same age groups that they would be with in the classrooms here at church, as well as our Canvas Youth YouTube channel. We are posting new videos every single Tuesday night, and these are interviews with Pastor David, and he's just interviewing people that have had really good lives, really hard lives, really showing that God is a God who loves every single person. So we would be so honored if you would go ahead and share those videos and watch them with your teenagers. Again, please like, share, and comment on the video. We want to help every single person have a life-giving relationship with Jesus, and you can help with that. Amen. We love you guys. Have an awesome week. Let the King of Life be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my soul. Let the King
we thank you that no matter what season we face, we can trust you completely, Jesus, and know that you are faithful to the end and you will never let us down, Jesus. No matter what we're facing in life, Jesus, with all the job loss and all the health crises around us, Jesus, we can stand in confidence knowing, God, that you won't let us down, that you'll be with us and you are faithful to the end. We say, this, we say today, God, that you are good, always good to us. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence.
let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price bear any burden meet any hardship support any friend oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. The sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery with its row upon row of simple white markers, bearing crosses or stars of David, they add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. Today we pray that those who lie here have found peace with their creator and we resolve that their sacrifice will always be remembered by a grateful nation. The fallen give silent witness to the price of our liberty and our nation honors them this day and every day. Welcome to Life Church 360. My name is Matt Morgan, and I get to be the lead pastor. And I'm so glad that you're with us this weekend. We just absolutely love that we get to preach the gospel online. It's absolutely amazing, and I'm so thankful for it. And I just want to welcome you. And if you're new and you've just been checking out our church, we would love to get to know you and for you to know more about the church. And one of the ways you can get started by doing that in doing that is you can take and click on the right-hand side of your screen the Connect card. And if you fill out as much as you're comfortable with, uh, what we will do is send you a little bit of information. We promise not to spam you, but you'll get a little bit of information about our church, and then you can begin to start to connect around here. And then, of course, I want to remind everybody, please share your prayer requests. We, we pray for you guys every single week as a staff, and when we get together, it's so much fun to be able to pray and, and just care about you. So please share your prayer requests with us. Right now, I would like to pray for all of the families who are remembering their loved ones who paid the ultimate price for our freedom. And it's such a big thing. Memorial Day weekend is such a powerful weekend. And I want to thank all of the families. You have uh, really sacrificed more than anyone should have to sacrifice. And you did it for all of us. And it's because of your loved ones serving. And I'd just like to pray a blessing over you guys. If you guys would join me. Father, uh, we love you. And uh, I pray, Father, for all the families that are remembering their loved ones right now. I pray, God, that you would minister to them in such a powerful way. God, I, I pray that they would sense your peace inside of them. And I, I pray, God, you'd, they'd sense your comfort because you said that, um, God, that you comfort those who have loss. And I just pray in Jesus' name for comfort in every single person. God, we love you. We need you. And we pray a safety over all of the men and women who are serving our country today and all of our first responders and all the families that are, are giving so much so that we can have what we have and get to do what we do. God, we love you. I, I pray that you'd help me today to preach your word. Help me, Jesus, to uh, minister and that this series we're going into would be a, a ministry for people uh, who are going through hard times right now. Lord, bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I also want to thank Pastor David, our youth, our youth pastor. He preached last week and did such a great job. And if you missed the message last week, you can pick it up online. And uh, it's right on our Facebook page. And he interviewed Pastor Ralphie, who is in Mexico. And uh, Pastor Ralphie was arrested there. He was supposed to be in jail for just a few days. It was really uh, for preaching the gospel, so he shouldn't even been in jail. Uh, but they, they, they have kept him there for five years. And he has led over 400 inmates to the Lord baptize them and uh, today he'll be actually translating the message into Spanish so that they can hear the message and so welcome all of you we are so glad that you're with us too uh, we just consider you part of us and we are praying for you guys all the time today we're beginning a new series and the series is called for the good and it's all about our focus, and, and it's, it's all about what we're looking for. And really, you have to choose 
your focus in life. I love Pastor Ralphie last week. He said, you know what? We use what we have. And he has such a joy in him, and he's preaching the gospel when he, when he really shouldn't even be in jail. And I'm just so, I was so touched by that, and it really got me thinking about a verse of Scripture and then just the title of this whole series. And I remember the first time I read this passage that I'm going to read to you today and, and teach on today. I, it was 1986. I was 17 years old. I was going into my senior year of high school. I had just given my life to Jesus. I met my wife at camp, the, the, like literally minutes after I had given my life to Jesus. And she, we obviously didn't get married right away, uh, but we dated for a long time and then we got married. And I remember reading the book of Romans. I was so excited about reading the book of Romans that I, I literally went into Godfather's Pizza where a bunch of my friends were and I started reading Romans 7 to them because I just was so excited. And then I get to Romans chapter 8, which is where we are today. And I remember reading this verse for the first time in Romans 8, 28. And you're going to actually see a picture of my Bible that I had when I was in high school. And it's one of my prized possessions. I don't bring it out very much because it's falling apart. Uh, our youth pastor said, underline things things in your Bible. So what I did is I pretty much underlined all of the book of Romans. And this verse and all of this passage that we're going to look at today is underlined. And you'll see that it's Romans 8, 28. And it says this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now I read that and, and at 17 years old, I did not have a tragic childhood. I had a wonderful childhood. And I just, I, I read that. I'm like, yes, you give your life to Jesus and everything is going to be great because God works for the good and everything. And, and now I'm 51 years old. And, and I got to tell you, I've been through so many ups and downs in my life. I, I, you know what it's like? It's kind of like, you know, when you just think like, okay, I'm really doing good. I, I've got it all together. And I just feel like I'm, I'm really like, God can really fill me up. And, and I'm just this solid, you know, Put together, everything's fine, and nothing's happening, and everything's good. And anybody live out there longer than, you know, a few years? Yeah, you know, something always comes up. Something just, you're going through life, and everything seems like it's really great, and all of a sudden, it's just like, uh-oh. And that's what goes on in life. And this passage says that God works everything for the stuff like this. He will work for the good. And you're probably like going, well, at 17 years old, I bet you would think that. Or maybe it was a 17-year-old who wrote this to a bunch of other 17-year-olds. In actuality, this verse of Scripture, the book of Romans, was written by a guy named Paul. He's known as the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul, when he was young, he was educated by the, the greatest of teachers. Uh, he, his family was pretty wealthy. Uh, he was a Jewish boy, and he was a Roman citizen. He had the best of both worlds. And he actually became a Pharisee, which is one of the greatest honors a Jewish boy could ever have. And so he becomes like really one of the best of the best, and people look up to him. And one day, he runs into Jesus on the road to Damascus. You'll have to read it in the book of Acts. And, and Jesus gets so a hold of Paul's heart as a, as a young man that he starts preaching about Jesus. And the moment he starts preaching about Jesus, he finds himself getting arrested, spit on, beaten. And it just seems like this is kind of a theme in his life. And, and he wants to preach the message of Jesus all over the known world, which would be the Roman Empire. And so Paul is, he's preaching about Jesus, but he keeps getting beaten and spit on and arrested. In fact, it, three times the Apostle Paul, the Bible says he was beaten with the 40 lashes minus one. Now that doesn't mean 39 lashes. What that means is, is they beat you so bad that by the time they think that you're almost dead, they stop and you wish you were dead. One time, Paul was beaten so badly for preaching the gospel of Jesus that he, they thought he, they killed him and they just left him in the street. I mean, like, this is the guy who, after all that happened, wrote all things work for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. 
This guy was shipwrecked and stuck on the island of Patmos. He, he knew hunger. He had to work as a tent maker, even though he was preaching the gospel after he came from such a great prominent place. And, and this guy writes to the Romans. And you're like going, well, who are the Romans? This is the people that we studied in school. If you studied the Roman Empire in school, it's them. Like, you know, the Roman Colosseum, and like, it, it actually was that bad. In fact, a lot of historians say worse than what they would depict on TV. This was a bloodthirsty group of people. Sexual immorality was at an all-time high, which means there was all kinds of relational pain happening in Rome. And when the Apostle Paul writes this to them, that all things work for the good, I'm telling you, that, that would be like a, a prominent statement well, it's found right in the middle of the book of Romans, teaching us a theology and a philosophy about God that really should shake us to the core of what God can and will do. People ask me as a pastor, they'll say, you know, Matt, I've, I've heard some of your story. And, and just to, to, to give you this, some of the highlights of, of hard things that have happened in my life that God has actually worked out some really good things from, uh, four major back surgeries, fighting prostate cancer and, and having surgery with that, uh, going through financial gain, complete financial bottom out, and, and having to work my way back into just, you know, solvency. And, and, and if anybody's been married longer than, you know, in a month, you realize that marriage has its ups and downs. I, I married my high school sweetheart. We're still married, and I love her with all my heart. But you all know that you go through ups and downs in marriage and, and, and raising kids, which has been wonderful. My kids are fantastic. But you, you know that when you have kids, and they, they push all these buttons inside of you and it's not that they, they mean to, it's just like all of the stuff that's inside of us starts to come out, especially when you have children and, and God starts teaching you things about your life and about who you are and, and you're starting to think, I mean, all things work for the good of those who love God. It's like, God, I love you. And, and then being a pastor and, and all the stuff you see as a pastor and, and there's so much turmoil and pain in people's lives. I know, yes, there's a lot of good stuff too, but there's a lot of hard stuff and people say how can you keep preaching about how good God is and and how God can do good things when you know there is so much pain and heartbreak out there right now even right now with COVID-19 and and just all of the stress and the strife that this is causing in people's lives it's like God can work this out and do something good in our life now, we believe in God doing miracles, instant miracles. We pray for them. We pray for people to be healed. And, and I have prayed for people, and I have seen people healed instantly. And that's an absolute miracle, and it's beautiful. But I would tell you, after all these years of my life, sometimes God does something even more miraculous than an instant miracle. And you're like, oh, what could be more miraculous? I mean, I want instant if I can have it. What's more miraculous? Well, the miracle of God's amazing redemption of brokenness. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about this in this series about how God can work all things for the good. When the Apostle Paul put this right in the middle of the book of Romans, he had been building a theology, building a philosophy about God, and sharing with people about how great God is, even in the midst of our brokenness and our pain. I've read the book of Romans so many times and taught on the book of Romans so many times that it's just, it's just such a beautiful book, and it encourages me every single time. If you were to read this book, and then you were like, okay, I'm going to step back, I'm going to zoom out, I'm going to look at the entire book, and, and then you were to say, okay, I'm going to explain this book, the theology of it, in one message, I'm going to use three points, well, that's what I'm about to do right now, and here are my three points. If I was to say, this is what the book of Romans is about, I would say this, God made it, we broke it, and Jesus fixes it. I want to talk about these three things because if, if you're going to really find the good, 
if God works for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purposes, you've got to learn how to focus. You've got to learn what to look for. And you have to have a, a theology and a philosophy that understands this big picture of life. First one, God made it. Now, when Paul wrote this, he wrote this to the people in Rome. And the people in Rome actually believed in God, which means they believed that there was a creator, a God that created all of this. They believed that, and, and, and they thought it was true, but there was something wrong. Something just went amiss. In Romans chapter 1, verses 21, the apostle Paul says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, which means to make them their own God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Paul says, if you read on here in Romans chapter 1, that their, their behavior, their actions, their heart became so deplorable that the Bible, God, it says that God just turned them over to their own evil desires, their own depraved mind, it says. I can't think of anything worse than God just washing his hands and saying, okay, you want to be that depraved, just you can have your depraved mind do what you want to do. And it just got worse and worse and worse. But before it got there, look what it said. They knew God, but they didn't make him their God. They wouldn't glorify him as God. And they wouldn't even give him thanks. Now, when you're going through a hard time, and I would say the people of Rome, unless they were at the top of the government, they were going through a lot of hard stuff. Slavery was at all-time high. People were dying in the Colosseum all the time. All kinds of relational brokenness happening. If that was what was going on, and, and life just did not seem to be working out, what can happen to us is our focus can begin to narrow to the place where all we see is what we gain or what we lose. And when all we can see is what we gain or what we lose, we start to lose track of where God is and what God is doing. And what can happen to us is that we can become so narrow in our thinking that literally you can think, thanks for nothing. I mean, seriously, God, this is what's going on in life? Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for nothing. And that's how the people of that time period really began to see God. And you might go, well, hey, right now, it's a pretty tough time. I mean, I, I looked on the, the stats, it was 91,000 people have died of COVID-19. We're having to stay at home because if, we're, if we go out and spread this thing, they say it will get worse and, and it's starting to get better and we're starting to open things back up, but people want it open faster and businesses are, are getting shut down and the economy is, is, it's like there's a lot of stress there's a lot of things happening that people are feeling it right now and you could start to say, God, thanks for nothing. Well, you might say, what would I thank God for? How about, how about some of this? God, thank you. Thank you for making the earth. You know what's amazing? Is, is scientists have studied like where we are in our galaxy, and like our galaxy isn't even the biggest galaxy, and there's millions of them, and our planet's not even in the middle of our galaxy, and, and the only planet they can actually find that's as far away as they can see that could sustain life is this one, Earth. And God says, you can live on my planet, and you can breathe my air, and you can drink my water, and eat my food, and enjoy my sunlight. This is all for you. And you can do whatever you want. You can still live here. And we can lose track. I, I don't know about you, but I've, I've loved reading some of the stories and the things that are out there. Some, some really great, like people have had some great revelation of faith in this time of, of COVID-19. There was an Italian man I read about on Facebook, and this was really interesting. You know how Italy was hit so hard with COVID-19, and this guy was in his 80s, and he got COVID-19, and he ends up going to the hospital, and while he's at the hospital, he had to be put on the ventilator, and they actually thought that he would die. But this guy recovered. And after several days of being on a ventilator, he recovers, and he, he gets to go home, and he gets his bill. 
And when he gets his bill, it's like, here, he's, he's looking at his bill and he's like, that's how much it costs to be on the ventilator for that many days. And he begins to weep. And the people around him, they were, they were saying, it's going to be okay. You, you know, it's going to be all right. We'll help you. You, you can get help. And, and the guy's like, oh, no, that's not my problem. I can afford to pay the bill for the days that I was on the ventilator in the hospital. I can afford to pay this bill. Here's my problem. I've been breathing God's air for over 80 years. I could never repay God. I'm just paying for this ventilator for just a few days. And God is like letting me breathe his air for all these years. That's a different perspective. God made it. Well, here's the next one. We broke it. And I say we, I don't mean necessarily you personally, you're, you're the responsible party for all this. We as in all of us. God designed the world. And when he designed the world, there was no sickness. There was no pain. There was no suffering. When God made the world, their sin had not entered the world, and they literally were given everything, and they could go where they wanted to go and do what they wanted to do. They could eat whatever they wanted to eat except for one thing. They couldn't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God says, I want you to trust me. You don't need to know good and evil. You just need to know my goodness, and, and just trust me. Don't eat from that. I will be your God. You will be my people. And what did they do? The same thing you and I would do, right? I mean, someone tells us not to do something, it's the only thing we want to do. And they eat from that tree and they broke that covenant with God and they brought sin into the world. Now, if you go back into Romans 8 here, I want to give you the theology here. Paul's building a theology. He's not just saying a buzzword that's a self-help thing. He's literally building a, a theology. And in Romans 8, 18, just back up a few verses, it says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. So Paul is saying, listen, there, there's something more. There's some present suffering that's happening right now, but this life is really, really short. And I consider that almost nothing compared to the joy of eternity for all forever and ever and ever. In verse 20, it says, For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The creation did not choose to be infected by sin. It was subjected to it. And ever since, it has literally been groaning. This, this is not what it wanted. This is not what's going to be good for us. And who subjected to it? It was man. We are the ones that brought the suffering and the pain. Now you might go, well, how do you know that? Well, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I've never met a person that would say I've never sinned. So we all admit that we sin. So on a, a, a macro level, we're all responsible. On a micro level, I'm responsible because I'm part of all. And what's happened is sin is multiplied exponentially over and over and over. And what sin does is it brings brokenness. It's that pot just broken and shattered. Literally, it's the abuse of ourselves and the abuse of others that brings so much pain in the world. God made it, and it's good, and we broke it. And here's the final part. Jesus fixed it. I want to read to you what Paul said in Romans 8, 28 until verse 39. It's such a powerful thing to get a hold of, of what he's trying to say about God working all things for the good. It says, and I'll start with verse 28 again. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. 
So scripture literally says that God knew you before you were born. The Bible says that about everybody. He knew you before you were born. The Bible says that God knit you together in your mother's womb. So God knows you. Scripture also says that all who call in the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. Meaning when we die, we go to heaven for the rest of our life because we've given Jesus our life and asked him to forgive us of our sins. So when this says that this idea of predestined, it's not just a few, it's everybody. In Christ Jesus, everybody can and will be saved through Christ Jesus just by putting your faith and trust in him. Verse 30, and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? I've talked to so many people. I'm just going to pause here because so many people think that God is not for them that God is against them, that, that they've done so many bad things in their life that God could never be for them, that God doesn't love them anymore, that God doesn't want them. But here's what Romans 5, 8 says. That's why I love this whole book of Romans. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That Jesus, he actually died for people who sin. He knew that we would sin, and he died for us as sinners. He didn't wait till we clean up our act and then say, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my life for them. No, he needed to give his life because we were sinners. He had to pay the price for our sin. And so I just want you to know that if you feel like you're just not good enough for God, welcome to the party. None of us are. In fact, Scripture says it is a free gift from God that no one could boast about it. Verse 33, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is he the one, is the one who condemns? No one. No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Do you know what the word interceding is? It's prayer. That Jesus isn't condemning us. He's actually praying for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, here comes the focus. Okay, I don't want you, this is it. We're going to boil this right down. This is our focus. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not even death can separate us from God. When I ended up with cancer, I had to tell my kids. And I, I'm so grateful for the type of cancer I got. You don't want to be grateful for cancer, but they could treat prostate cancer. And I told my kids they can treat this. And my oldest daughter is a scientist. She, at the time, she was at the University of Washington, you know, studying uh, molecular biology. So I'm like just going, this kid's so smart. And, and, and she looks up all the stuff on it. And she's like, Dad, still, this, this can be bad stuff. And, and I had to say to my kids, you know what? Even if I die, I win. Nothing can separate me from Christ. Nothing. You guys, I've, I've been through all kinds of different pain in my life. Physical pain, relational pain, financial pain, mental pain. Nothing can separate me. We never lose. And God will make all things out for the good of those that are in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus fixed it. He fixed it. And what's so incredible is no matter what, 
he can make something good. I, I, I will just openly say, I don't want to go through any of these hard things that I've been through, and I don't want you to go through any more hard things, but I'll also say that God didn't cause them so that he could do something good in me. God just knows there's pain in the world because of sin in the world. And what God can do is something beautiful in the midst of pain. My good friend Ilsa has joined me on the platform. You've been noticing she's been working like crazy back there, putting back together this pot that I broke. And uh, Ilsa, if you'll join us, I'll, I'll hold it, and then you can go ahead and grab that. Now, this is a uh, little art form. It's actually a Japanese art. And why don't you tell us a little about the art form, what you've been doing? So this is an art form called kintsugi, and I think that's how you pronounce it. We'll go with it. Pretty much they... Um, Japanese culture, they will take pottery and instead of once it breaks, throwing it away because it's of no use anymore, they repair it with gold. So we use glitter for this instance, but they put gold in here. The pottery becomes more valuable because it has gold in it. It becomes stronger and it becomes more beautiful than it was before it was broken. So they take something broken and totally remake it into something more beautiful than it was before. You know, as a pastor, I have been able to experience myself and also see in people that when they're broken and they let Jesus put them back together, it's actually some real gold in the middle of all that pain. When we, when we planned this message, else you had, you had mentioned Kintsugi and you had this idea. So I said, well, will you do it? And while we're on the, on the stage, will you do this? And uh, Ilsa said she would. And, and it, this, this message means a lot to her. And if you feel like you can share a little bit, uh, why don't you share why this means so much to you? So this past year has been a very challenging year for our family. Um, starting about a year ago, we had some challenges within our home. Um, ended up resulting in a separation, and which is now turning into a divorce. It's been really hard on me. It's been really hard on the kids. Um, no one wants to have to go through that. But I feel like as we've gone through all of that, God has kept reminding me that just because my vessel got broken doesn't mean it's done and no good anymore. He's putting me back together. He's gluing me back together. And he's just holding me together until that glue dries. <laughs> and so this to me is what I'm going through right now. And so really have a lot of appreciation for that. You feel like this pot that's drying because I can feel it. Yes. So I got to be careful drying. here. It's drying. <laughs> so I want to thank you very much. And uh, it take, took a lot of courage for you to do this. And we're praying for you and for your family. So we love you. God bless you. you. Yeah. I'm going to put this over here. I will say without any hesitation and with all my heart, my dearest friends, my people that I trust I love, I would probably say you would even say this of people you know, people who were, were willing to be real about their life, actually share what's going on inside of them, share what's going on around them, and then tell the truth and lean into Jesus in the middle of their pain and let God start putting that back together and using that gold that he puts in there. It literally, what, what I've seen is God never wastes a hurt that God can put you back together. And, and I want you to know that we're all going through hard stuff. It, it, it's everybody does. And some stuff is harder than others. I will definitely admit to that. But I will let you know that he makes all things for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. And I want to pray with you right now. Maybe you are in a place where you have been maybe away from God for a while. Maybe, maybe you used to go to church and now you're kind of looking into it again and you're like going, you know what? I need to recommit my life to Jesus and I want to give that opportunity. Maybe you never have. Maybe you never even understood that, that God made it and we broke it and Jesus fixed it and you're ready to give your life to Jesus. You can do that right now and I would love it. I would actually be honored if you would share it. I'm giving my life back to Jesus. I'm giving my life to Jesus. Just write it right there in those memos because Jesus 
really wants to do something beautiful in your life. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we need you. And I pray, Father, for anybody right now who's saying, Jesus, I need to give my life back to you. I've been away from you, and I've gotten my focus off of you, and uh, I, my, my, I need, God, you in me, and I pray that you'd forgive me of my sins. I pray that you'd be the leader of my life. I thank you for my life. I thank you for what you've given me, and I pray, God, that you would help me to follow you the rest of my life. And for anybody who's just, even the first time, just say those words from your heart and he will come in and he will do things. You will start to feel him gluing you back together, cementing you back together, making you whole and making something good out of the brokenness in your life. Thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. I really want to thank you guys for being with us. And uh, I also wanted to let you guys know that Life Church 360 continues to minister. Our church is not closed. We are the church, okay? So we are relocated in our homes all over the place. And we continue to share and love and give uh, the Convoy of Hope. You know, we, we brought the whole semi-load of food in here and it all went out. That was incredible, 1,300 bags of food. Uh, we have our food bank that's open every Saturday. If you need food, please come to our community center. It's 3310 Smoky Point Drive at noon. Uh, we had 60 families come last week, 10 brand new families. That's about the average every week. You keep hearing about the same number. It's amazing. Uh, people keep coming. We wanna keep ministering to other people. We wanna keep ministering to our community in every way that we can. And the way that we've been able to do that is because even though we're not here, which is so amazing to me, is so many of you continue to be faithful and you continue to give. And I want you to know if you've been watching and you're like, you're not a regular part of this, I'm not like doing a big plea for everybody to give. Um, the church doesn't go forward without people giving. Um, and those of you who continue to give and tithe and do those things, I just want you to know how you can, especially now because we're not meeting in the facility. And you can give by texting. That's a really cool way to give. It's easy. Um, and you go 77977 is the phone number. It's not a phone number. It's a 77977. You text LC360 space APP app and then the dollar amount. And it will walk you through a secure process where you can give that dollar amount. If you would like to set up recurring gift or give through our website, you can do that. All that is secure. And you go to our website, uh, lifechurch360.com, top right hand side, and you could set that up and, and go for that. You can even send a check if you want to. Thank you guys for your faithfulness. Thank you guys for being a part of Life Church 360. We love you guys. God bless you. Have a great week.